This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Have you noticed that the language around climate keeps changing? First it was global warming, then it was climate change, and now it's the climate crisis. And just recently, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres referred to global boiling. Doesn't this indicate that scientists don't know what they're doing and they're just trying to whip up fear? No. The language around climate is very carefully chosen and has evolved for a very good reason. In Don't Even Think About It, author George Marshall describes climate change as a quote, perfect problem. An issue is challenging enough if it concerns only losses and no gains. And it is challenging if those losses are long term, not short term. And it is challenging if it has substantial uncertainty. Climate change appears to be the perfect combination of all three factors. Which makes it so incredibly difficult to respond to effectively. Except, as Marshall talks about in the book, that is only the case if we frame the problem, and our response to it, in those terms. I'd highly recommend everyone reads this, by the way. I'll leave a link in the description. A key point that Marshall makes is that language matters. In order to make people care about and take action on climate change, an issue that is intangible, largely slow, and yet incredibly serious, scientists need to use the most precise language to elicit a response. When scientists initially started talking about human emissions of carbon dioxide heating up the planet, the phrase global warming seemed to be the right one, because the planet was on average warming up. But the problem was, it wasn't doing so uniformly. As became clear, weather extremes were shifting. Some places saw more extreme cold, or more or less rainfall. It wasn't just warming. When these events took place, people quite reasonably asked, what about global warming? My average weather just got colder. Or unreasonably said, so much for global warming, it just snowed. In my job, I think of this meme quite a lot. So to better reflect the changing climate, which was on average but not everywhere warming, scientists started using the phrase climate change. In terms of people's lived reality, it was more accurate, and so in theory would lead to greater believability of scientists and so make people more likely to heed their warnings. But it isn't just about accuracy. It's one thing to make people aware of an issue, it's something entirely different to make them want to do something about it. And the science is very clear, we do need to do something about climate change or suffer serious consequences. And here we enter the murky realm of psychology. If you want someone to do something, is it more effective to make them afraid of the consequences of not doing it, or show them the benefits of doing it? In other words, which emotion is more likely to make them do the thing? Fear or hope? To test this, at an event that I recently hosted, I presented my audience with two headlines about climate change in the 21st century. One based around fear, and one based around hope. Put up your hand if you think the first statement is more compelling. Okay. And now put up your hand if you think the second statement is more compelling. Okay, interesting. Pretty clearly, my audience found the positive statement with connotations of hope more engaging than the negative statement with connotations of fear. Of course, however, I'm not the first person to do this kind of experiment. There is an extensive academic literature on the subject of emotive language and climate change, and asking which emotions are most effective at inducing an audience to take action on climate. The conclusion of this literature is that things are a bit more complicated than just good emotion, good good, bad emotion, bad. As became clear at the event when I asked people why they found a certain statement more compelling than the other. Oh, doesn't work. Are we on? Dandy? Yeah, right. <laughs> why do you think that first statement is more compelling? It shows the severity of the situation. So 1.5 degrees doesn't really mean anything for most people, especially because it's an average. They don't realize that there's two extremes. Negative emotions work way more hard than the positive ones, especially when you're trying to pay make people pay attention. Too much like a call to action because time is running out. Whereas the next one is like still time to limit. So it's like the, the second one it feels more like fluffy and rounded to me. I feel like the lowercase s also draws me off. <laughs> <laughs> The second statement is more interesting. The second one is better because we hear so much doom and gloom about climate change, so it's nice to actually have something positive, and I think that would catch another side of people that want to that want to take action. Not only is it more hopeful, there's also solutions. Doom scrolling is enough of our lives that we don't need to add more to it. It sort of blurs into the background. The decision makers, 
people who are really making decisions about um, like shipping companies or, or they need to know that it's, it's something that can be done. The second one feels more like, okay, there's still time, we can still do something. I'm going to engage in this. Brilliant. So I think, I think it's very interesting that for some people, hope is a more powerful emotion. And for some people it's fear. Like it's very, it is like a Jedi Sith kind of device, <laughs> it feels like. The crucial takeaway from my event and from the literature is that the same language hits differently with different cultures, with different groups of people. When talking about climate change, the emotion most likely to inspire action in an audience will vary depending on the audience. In one culture, the emotion most likely to inspire action on climate is fear. In another, it might be anger. In another, it might be hope. It's why fear-laden books like The Uninhabitable Earth will resonate with some audiences, but actively turn off others. And the same for hopeful books like The Future We Choose. The net effect of a particular narrative could be negative depending on the emotion used, the size of the target culture, and how the narrative will be perceived by other groups who hear it. In any form of communication, it is imperative to have your target audience in mind. By trying to talk to everyone at once, you talk to no one effectively. It's why top-level climate communication from bodies like the UN and the IPCC is so difficult, and why it quite frequently misses the mark with at least some cultures. For example, when Guterres said the phrase global boiling, it effectively engaged some people, but it was actively damaging to the engagement of others who said that the language was inaccurate and sensationalist. Marketing 101. Target your language to your target audience. Something made much more difficult in an age of social media when every message ends up spreading everywhere. So what does this mean for how scientists and activists should talk to the public about climate? Well, it will vary case by case. There's no one-size-fits-all approach. In some cases, you are more likely to inspire action on climate change by making your target audience angry about how costly inaction so far has proven, as was shown in a study in Norway. In other cases, it would be more effective to make your audience want to build new green infrastructure to provide hope of a better future, as will likely be the case with a younger audience suffering from climate anxiety. Ultimately, you just have to know your audience. The undercurrent of all this, however, is one more factor. Time. I mentioned previously that the language we use to describe the problem of and solution to climate change is incredibly important. Not just because it determines the type of response we have to the problem, but it also determines the nature of the problem itself. There's this phenomenal quote from the late great Archbishop Desmond Tutu speaking about apartheid in South Africa. This is one of my all-time favorite quotes. Language is very powerful. Language does not just describe reality. Language creates the reality it describes. The critical issue is time. The science is unequivocal that we have a narrowing window to avoid causing significant, irrevocable damage to the world we depend on for our survival. No matter what emotion we want an audience to feel when discussing climate, we need them to know that now is the time for action. Now is the time to put whatever emotion they are feeling into effect. And this is why climate change has become the climate crisis. I think it's a very carefully and very accurately chosen word to articulate the time sensitivity of our response. And by using it, we create the reality that necessitates an immediate response. Of course, that reality isn't being created, it already exists, just to an omnipresent being that can somehow feel all the datasets that scientists have collected over decades. To be very clear, I'm not talking about manufacturing a reality that matches what scientists want people to think. We're talking about creating a human accessible reality, bound by the limitations of human experiences and human language. A representation of a global problem, far beyond any individual's experiences, and yet one that we must grasp. What form that representation takes will depend on the audience you're talking to, but the common factor between all representations is just how little time we have. Considering the expected impacts of inaction, calling it a climate crisis is accurate. It conveys severity and the need for immediate action. 
but it's just a name. How we use that name and how we refer to our actions to address the climate crisis cannot be determined in a one-size-fits-all approach. Our language must be tailored to the audience we wish to reach, forming a multitude of climate realities described in media. So if you've noticed that the language around climate has changed, that's because the climate has changed. And as the window for meaningful action narrows, the need for tailored, emotive language around climate becomes ever greater. Climate communication is only going to get more sophisticated and more diverse from here. Because it has to. Using dry scientific language didn't work. And so scientists now are forced to use the full gamut of emotive language to inspire the action that we as a global society need to take. If you would like to put the headlines around climate change into context, whatever language they use, then you could do with a primer on climate, or statistics, or solar energy. Fortunately, fun and free courses on those subjects and many more are available on Brilliant, who have kindly sponsored this video. Brilliant is the best way to learn maths, science and computer science interactively. Their hundreds of lessons, accessible via browser or their app, are built around the concept of engaging a student, introducing new concepts and then immediately getting you to apply them. For example, their new course on exploring data visually introduces you to a data set of Starbucks cafes, and then examines how to most effectively slice and represent this data. You are involved from the very beginning. If you're looking to improve your understanding of how scientists talk about the natural world through statistics and through equations, then I cannot recommend Brilliant highly enough. Their courses are gorgeous, they're constantly being updated, and they're based on the principle that I think is most effective when it comes to individual learning. You can get access to Brilliant for free for a full 30 days by visiting brilliant.org slash Simon Clark or clicking the link in the description. The first 200 of you to do so will also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. That's brilliant.org slash Simon Clark. With thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really hope that you enjoyed it. If you were inspired by the use of language around climate change, I would highly recommend Don't Even Think About It, the book I mentioned at the start of the video. Please do check out the description for a link to that, as well as a link, of course, to Brilliant. Also down there in the description, you'll find a link to my Patreon. If you'd like to support me making more videos, get access to behind the scenes content, and have a say in some of the topics that I cover, then you can support me at patreon.com forward slash Simon Oxfizz. These people on screen right now are my lovely executive producer patrons who support me at the top tier. Thank you so much much for making this work possible. If you enjoyed the video, you know what to do. Pop it a like, share it, comment. You've been on YouTube before. That just leads me to say, if you'd like to watch something else, here's some recommended viewing next. Thank you again so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.